Hare Krishna, everyone. Welcome to our next session um, on the topic of karma with His Grace Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. Very grateful to have him again with us um, since Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Welcome. Since he's um, such a knowledgeable uh, monk and mentor in our community. So last time we had spoken about um, karma in a very basic way. And uh, <laughs> Prabhu, you, you have agreed to kindly recap briefly what we spoke about last time. And then we're going to continue on this time <clears throat> building on those concepts because there can be some, uh, you know, confusion and misconceptions specifically around the idea of uh, mercy, compassion in the face of karma. I'm hearing a little bit of an echo. Prabhu. Are you able, are you listening? Are you hearing the echo as well? Uh, let me see. Let me just turn Is off your mic now? while I'm speaking. Uh, I'm just going to try that for now. Uh, okay. okay. Sorry it, about that. Is it somewhat better now? Maybe. Let me, if, when I speak, I'll, I'll know. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay. So today we wanted to focus on how, how to understand karma in an empowering way for us so that we don't kind of lose sight of the goal of karma. Why does karma exist and how to not become <clears throat> a little bit maybe jaded by uh, other people's uh, situations in our own situation. But sometimes we can become a bit apathetic, a bit uh, la lacking compassion. If we look at everyone in, in, uh, with this eye, the lens of karma, sometimes people criticize mm. this idea of karma um, as being, oh, well, then, then that's how the caste system and that's how there's a lot of discrimination. Sometimes that, that's, it's a misconception and it's perceived like that. So we're going to peel some layers today. Um, I, I welcome you, Prabhu, to maybe just recap what we spoke about last time and then um, uh, start with this idea. Yes, of... certainly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank so you. broadly, I think we discussed four points last time. That first was that when we talk about karma, what exactly do we mean by it? So mm -hmm. you know, karma is... Sometimes it becomes confusing because it can also refer to the action that we are doing, the reaction mm -hmm. we are getting. It can also refer to the system of karma, action, reaction. And then it can also refer to one particular kind of action where we have karma, that is good karma. Then we have we karma, which is bad karma. It can also mm -hmm. be a karma, karma which brings no reactions. So in that context, then now why do we even need to consider the idea of karma at all? So because we see in the world that we all act to get sorry it's frozen a little bit Some i wonder reason. if you can hear results but sometimes we don't get the results that we expect not only the opposite of what we expect yeah. am i better now clearer it's come back now so if we could just maybe repeat yeah. that last bit please yeah so why do we need to even consider karma because we all act in the world seeking some results and if those results right. don't come, then naturally it bewilders us. Sometimes we get even the opposite of what we expect. So karma gives us a broader framework to understand things. So in that connection, right. we discussed how the reaction, the connection between karma and phala is not just one-to-one -one correspondence. Mm -hmm. There is karma plus daiva plus kala will lead to phala. So karma is the action that we do, our endeavors, our, our duties. Daiva is destiny, kismat, fate. That, so just like if a farmer has to plow the land and sow the seeds, that's karma. And the rains have to come in the right time and right quantity, that's daiva. Right. And in the kala is, we have to wait till the harvesting season comes. Then the crops will come. So karma, daiva, kala will lead to follow. And then sometimes we may see that I am doing my karma, but I'm not getting the phala. That's because presently daiva is unfa unfavorable. So accept it. And then we can tolerate it. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't do our karma at all. That is, so when Krishna talks about be detached from the fruits of your work, that doesn't mean don't care, don't set goals, don't care for the fruits. It's just that recognize that your karma alone doesn't lead to phala. So don't get so mm -hmm. worked up about it. Right. So one extreme is, is daivavad which holds that everything is destined what is the use of our doing any work at all the other mm -hmm. extreme is karmavad which is my work alone will produce the results 
but we need a balance between the two and with that balance we can move forward more effectively and then ultimately we discuss that if we are practicing bhakti and turning toward krishna uh, through bhakti practices then no matter what our daiva may bring to us we can find a higher shelter we can find an mm-hmm. anchor so the by our destiny by our various situations we face we may actually get a lot of sufferings which may be like waves coming into our us when we are in the ocean but if those waves are not not sweep us away then we need an anchor mm-hmm. and that's why now we say that whatever karma may get us to krishna will get us through <laughs> whatever karma may get us to krishna, krishna will get us through get us through beautiful thank you so much you're you're well known well, world renowned uh in your ability to be able to concisely and precisely summarize uh hours long worth of a uh, discussion so thank you so much for summarizing so wonderfully the last conversation we had about karma um so recently there's again there's been this topic you know i'm sure you've heard of stephen fry in in the uk he's a well known atheist and he has yes. quoted famously that uh, i don't believe in god but if i ever met him i would i would say how dare you how dare you put bone cancer in young babies in in children what you know what gives you the right he's he's so angry at god because the conception in especially in abrahamic religions maybe or or where they don't believe in reincarnation or they don't understand the concept of our own action um they they tend to be you you, you must except then the idea that it's kind of god's random arrangement in the beginning of life <laughs> when i hear his his statement uh, like this uh, towards god i i realize that's because they don't understand reincarnation and it's such a sad thing because really many people as soon as the suffering comes we tend to blame god or someone around us yeah, yeah. first thing to do is to so this idea of random chance of some baby being born with a terminal disease and so much pain and suffering for no reason in some sense that uh, yes. so ha- <laughs> so sorry i, I know we're talking it. about something else but right if no, we no, can i begin- understand it's very important it's good you brought this up mm-hmm. so you know i would respond to something like this first of all it's true it's very painful it can raise questions about uh, uh very the basis of fairness in existence and the idea of a god a good god will naturally be questioned so i understand the question is entirely reasonable mm having right. said that that the question is entirely reasonable we need to move forward a little bit and consider one important point that without go- let's say that we we say there's no god for argument's sake Mm. that's the atheist beginning premise that right atheism begins with there's no god and then we talk about why bad things happen to good people mm. or why like, like innocent by babies who have done nothing are suffering okay then the question comes is that why let's turn the question around let's assume there is no god why should bad things not happen to good people hmm <laughs> That's, that's right if it was if it was just completely random chance right that's a very fair question why would we even have that question why would ah. we even have that question so yes. the very the fact that we have a innate sense of fairness <laughs> and to a significant extent things do work fairly i'm not saying mm. always but overall you we can reasonably say that you know, if somebody comes has Uh, somebody has a car accident it could be that some drunk driver drove over them it mm. could also be that they drove irresponsibly mm. it could be that so generally speaking there is some cause effect connection that we know yes. so most of the times we are able to see cause effect causal connections mm. and that is why when we are not able to see it that appears so objectionable to us mm. so what we do is we need to expand our framework so this is a little scientific but cousin you quoted stephen fry i will give this example in the history of science when newton came up with the law of gravity and the laws of motion that seemed to be the bedrock foundation of physics and it right. thought now we'll be able to explain the whole universe with that but then 
as science started going deeper and deeper at the microscopic level and to subatomic particles, and as it started going further and further to the universal level, macrocosmic level, right. at both levels, Newton's laws didn't work. Exactly. The fundamental particles don't follow Newton's laws. Mm. And celestial objects don't follow Newton's laws. Right. So now did scientists say because of that, that, oh, Newton's laws don't work. Mm. No, we don't reject Newton's laws. So what happened is they tried to expand the framework within which Newton's laws are like a special case. So Newton's right. laws do work at a particular level, but when they don't work, we don't reject the theory. We expand the theory. So now Einstein came up with the general theory of relativity. And within mm. that, Newton's laws are considered to be a subset. They work at our normal observational level, mm. but at very small and very big levels, they don't work. Exactly. So similarly, at a normal level, we do see, you know, if say if any mother has a kid who comes back home and their kids' clothes are very dirty, he says, What were you doing? She says, No, they just became dirty by chance. No, mm. we don't function like that. Nobody can function like that for that matter. Isn't it? Such a good so point. It's like, so it's so we do accept cause effect connection, and when cause effect connection doesn't make sense for us, that mm. time do we reject cause effect connection? Okay, Stephen Fry may say that what kind of God will do that? Mm. But then is he ready to accept the point that there is no cause effect connection at all? We say no. Then we say no, no. There is a cause effect connection. Science talks about cause effect connection, but science doesn't talk about human experiences. You know, science can't explain. Literally speaking, I mean, science can't explain why a particular person has bone cancer. You know, can you mm. go back into genetics and say, okay, this child was born with this one? Well, sometimes you can't find anything in the parents also. Mm. Why did this person get it? Genetically, see, there are many, we can have broad explanations of why a particular disease comes. Okay, this is the cause of the disease and this is the cure for it. But why did this disease come to this person and not to this person? Right. In the same house, you know, with the pandemic going on, in the same house, there may be five people and three people get infected. One of them gets very severely infected. One of them gets lightly infected. Two people don't get infected at all. Mm. Why the difference? <laughs> so now I'm not saying that science doesn't offer us an explanation. It does. But it doesn't explain all the observable data exhaustively. So we need right. a broader framework. Limited. Right. So what happens is the broader framework is from uh, uh, from the perspective of uh, karma, that there is cause effect correlation and there's a significant amount of cause effect correlation in our observation. But there's there will be some amount of cause effect correlation that may go beyond our observation. It's just like when a child, is a child has a, the parents have a garden, the child is sowing something in the garden. Now, sometimes, you know, if you show grains, you can see the grains coming up within three, four months. But if they sow a mango tree or a mango seed, that may take 20 years to give mangoes, depending on which part of the world we are and which kind of mangoes they are. So right. now something comes in two months, something takes 20 years. In both cases, seeds are being sown, but the time frame will vary. Hmm. So similarly, our actions lead to results, but they may have a different time frame. So, okay, if we, let's say that, no, no, this is just, you can't explain one thing, so you have come up with another explanation. Hmm. You can't explain this. So you, like there are the, often the atheistic argument is that to explain one exp unexplainable, you come up with another thing, which is, is also not explainable. Okay, how do you hmm. know this is true? Hmm. Let's see what options do we have for explaining, say, such iniquities as terrible disease in small children. See, one option is chance. It's just random. Now, if it's just random, hardly anyone functions like that. None of us function that everything is by random. No. No. If everything were random, science itself would not function because science presumes there is cause and effect and we try to find a cause and a cause of a correlation. It's the basis On of, of scientific that, technique, exactly. So that's the first thing. If it's a chance, now it's, it's nobody functions like that in real life. And if it were chance, what does it mean basically? The universe is reduced to a lottery. Mm -hmm. And some, some people are just the lucky winners and some people are the unlucky losers. And that's all there is. So this is actually a very, very gloomy way of living. <laughs> and what happens is by, if we accept this view of living, the sufferings of life are still there. 
they're not going to go away right. whether i'm atheist or i'm a theist the sufferings are still there atheism does not remove the sufferings of life it only removes the hope that the sufferings have some purpose right beautiful it point it does not remove the sufferings either way if my child uh, if I, my child has cancer uh, has some terrible disease they have the disease whether i'm atheist or theist but at least Ooh. if i have some faith in god then i have some hope that maybe this suffering has some purpose i don't know what the purpose is but at least the hope is there in mm. atheism there is no hope so that's one thing right so, so huge that, point very forward, very powerful point yeah. Go on. So now somebody said, "No, actually, you are just being utopian. There is no hope. You are imagining hope where there is no hope." Mm. Okay, that could be possible, but as I said, we don't function like that. We always try to look for cause-effect connections everywhere. Now that's how science develops. That's how we normally function in day-to-day life. That's how we look for accountability in our relationships. So right. to say that what is happening is meaningless, the, how it becomes like that is if we accept this. No, it's all random. It's like, you know, science posits science often asks accuses religion. Why do you do this irrational ritual? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Why do you worship this deity? Why do you do that? But then, what happens is, what is the end result of the atheistic worldview? Now, I'm not equating science with atheism. Science is simply a tool for learning about reality, and currently, mm-hmm. science is largely run by people who are atheists. Right. Not entirely, and that's why science is sometimes seen as a tool for atheism. but mm-hmm. science and atheism are two different things so all that yes. none of what i'm saying is against science is right. saying that atheism is a school it's a philosophy it's an ideology and science is a tool which atheists right. are co- prominently using so the p- problem here is that when we say that is okay this ritual doesn't make make sense that ritual doesn't make sense okay but within the atheistic world view ultimately nothing makes sense life itself doesn't make sense <laughs> we are born we exist for some time we struggle through life and then we die and absolutely even atheists are very very proud of scientific discoveries scientific advancements see we understood this and we understood that and we understood that so it's mm-hmm. like we're proud of finding small islands of meaning <laughs> while claiming that the whole while drowning in an ocean of meaninglessness right an ocean of meaninglessness it's such a such irony it's it's so ironical yeah so, so that's the atheistic world view so yes you may we may not be able to make sense of some things but we have innate hunger for meaning and atheism mm-hmm. certainly doesn't atheism may offer us some islands of meaning but mm-hmm. ultimately we drown in the ocean of ocean of meaninglessness what wow. theism offers us is theism does tell us yeah there are some areas you could say they are like marshes where it's of meaninglessness but theism yeah. says ultimately there is land and yeah. you can go toward that land so we could yeah. say the atheistic world view is islands of meaninglessness with within an islands of meaning within an ocean of meaninglessness the theistic world view is you could say a vast landmass of meaning with some patches of meaninglessness you know, right. i can't make sense of this i can't make sense of that i can't say that but overall atheism says yes the universe is orderly right but within this we need to qualify see what happens mm. is the mainstream theistic world view in today's world is the Abra- comes from the abrahamic religions right. and in the abrahamic religions they generally don't accept reincarnation and because right. of that what happens is these kind of cases where a small child is born with terrible diseases they are just unexplainable you can say that oh it is god's will and, and uh, it is it is god or justice one of my friends was from that what happened was that when he said you know why did why does god do something like this you know small children suffering so he said god justice is different from ours that was the answer he got from his priest and then he said okay god justice may be different from ours but it should be better than ours not worse than ours <laughs> not worse it should be better ours. than ours <laughs> exactly said, like, small child is suffering helplessly what kind of justice is that so in that sense even in the in the christian tradition there's the book of old testament there's the book of job where job mm-hmm. is a person who goes through a lot of suffering but ultimately god even god doesn't give answer why is suffering because you know without considering previous lives it's very difficult to explain 
It's so not, I'll give a metaphor for this. Now, to illustrate this point. It's, I'll give a metaphor. You know, cricket is quite popular in India as well as in England. So yeah. say, suppose uh, there's a cricket match going on. And somebody looks at the scoreboard and they see, hey, we just started this match. But this team's score is zero for seven. There are zero runs and seven wickets out. Hey, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> starting itself. Or this, this team's score is already 200. And it's starting only. Mm. This doesn't make sense. So if this, if yeah. the scoreboard, the, the scoreboard seems to be independent of the match being played. See? Exactly. The match has not started all uh, started, and still there is an arbitrary bias in the scoreboard. This mm. doesn't make sense. Nobody would right? accept it. This team just came into bat and their score is already 200. Mm. How does that happen? So one explanation could be that the scoreboard is just working by working by chance. Whatever comes up over there. Mm. Huh. That could be one explanation. Yeah. The second, this is the, this is the atheistic theory. Irrespective of how we are functioning, this life seems to be working randomly. Mm. The other is, so uh, so the other is that this team just came into bad, but the score was so good for this team and the score is so bad for this team. You could say the score, so scorekeeper is arbitrary. There is a scorekeeper, mm. but the scorekeeper is arbitrary. Where the scorekeeper arbitrarily favors some people and not and disfavor some people. The third explanation right. could be that this is a test match and this is a second innings going on. Right. Left so over. If one team the, previous the beginning has a 200 lead, that could be because that team has batted before earlier. Earlier better. Mm. Exactly. So so some people they are born on with very comfortable situations. Some people are born with terrible situations. Like the starting score is different. So we have three explanations. One is chance. The other is, you could use the word divine ca divine caprice or divine arbitrariness. Apathy. Mm, I have to, yeah. arbit you have to believe that God arbitrarily decides this child mm. will be born sick, this child will be born healthy. This child will be born poor, this child will be born wealthy. It is good. If the only choices were between arbitrary chance and arbitrary God, many right. people will choose would prefer arbitrary chance. Arbitrary chance. Because <laughs> it's like the movie. I'm, I'm sure for, I'm sure Prabhu, you don't yeah. know about this movie. But in, in the Avengers, Thanos, he's the he's the main god. Yeah, and I he would, would, arbitrarily yeah. decides I'm going to kill off half the population because there's too many people. And he's the most powerful god. I'm just gonna kill them randomly. <laughs> and that's his and, and when you see that, clearly he's the bad guy. He's the bad guy in the movie. The whole world is fighting against this maniac, God, that would do this. You know, so so leaving, like, I like your point of saying that chance, random chance is more preferable than a random God. Yes, because at least I don't have to worship chance. On one side, God is random, and then I am expected to devote myself to that random God. Exactly. Would Why would I do that? Exactly. Ah. So, if it, these are the only two options, then atheism would be a natural logical choice. Exactly. But there is third understanding. Third right. understanding is that this is the second innings. Or you can say it's not a second innings, multiple innings. In cricket, we don't mm. have multiple innings. But in our right. in our soul's journey, there are multiple innings. Right, right, right. So, because of this, uh, we can't, if we have to see the most sensible explanation. Mm -hmm. Or you could say the most pragmatically empowering explanation mm. that, okay, why did I get a child like this? Mm. I could say that, oh, I am just unlucky. That's one way of looking at it. I could say this is just God is angry with me. Well, mm. okay. This is okay. Maybe, maybe there's something from the past life's karma, which has to be cleared. And mm. at least what this karma philosophy does is that it gives me, it tells me to some extent at least the reins of the chariot of my life are in my hands. It's empowering. I may have been, yeah, yes. it's empowering. Yes. Yes. So, okay, maybe I did something negative in the past because of which I got some negative results. But if I choose wisely now, if I act mm -hmm. positively now, I can create a better future. Otherwise, the I other plans will go against me and I'll be ruined. Or maybe God will go against me and I'll be ruined. Mm. So in that sense, let's put the past aside. If we look at the future itself, the, all of us have to live 
go on with life irrespective of whatever situations come in our life so from a purely pragmatic perspective which is the world view that is most empowering for us right which is the which is the world view is, is it that everything is by chance if a child is going to school mm. and you tell the child that the child has got very poor marks you continue studying hard but you know the kind of marks you get it'll be by chance only how much you study is not going to matter <laughs> they tell the child you study very hard but you know the teacher is biased and teacher is opinionated whatever marks the teacher gives that will be independent of your studies right Where? why would the child study <laughs> exactly uh. so so i wouldn't go so far as to say that you no know, karma is the best explanation or the most satisfactory explanation you know, the, it is it is very it is very difficult when a person is going through that pain of some terrible injustice coming in our lives mm. but what i would say is that ultimately this problem which is called in philosophical circles the problem of evil mm. no we we never have a completely satisfactory explanation for this mm. but what we can have is the least unsatisfactory explanation mm. <laughs> it's wonderful not, I mean, somebody is going through suffering like that somebody has a child like that just saying that it is because of karma okay to some extent it might be intellectually satisfying okay it may be it's like that but still emotionally the heart will still be hurt heart will still be pained right so i i won't say that this is like a magic wand which explains everything mm. but at least you can say even if somebody doesn't find the explanation fully coherent among the options available we can definitely say this is the least unsatisfactory explanation wonderful and it's a great segue the into the next next yes, part yes. of the question that uh, we already explained before that karma at least it has a purpose and it, you know you're saying it's not just karma it's not just your action it's also daiva and kala and then finally you get the result so you, you're saying it's not a complete explanation of everything that we see the reality that we perceive is not simply a to z karma you know so it's it's uh, so how can we yeah how can I, we I'll put huh? aside, it's, yeah it's not is a to z karma it is that we may not know the we may never come to know the a to z of karma right but that doesn't mean it is not a sorry you're uh, back to see it's a, there's a small lag so one of the, uh, it keeps cutting the common question is that people ask okay okay can you hear me now can you hear me yeah. now still i can hear you but the screen um okay. the video keeps it's frozen is it okay now it's fine is it better now so, yeah okay thank you so if we look at uh, when i said that it's not all karma and that's not exactly what i meant what i meant was that because we do not know the details of what right. a particular person did in a particular life so in that sense it it at our level of cognition it's not a complete explanation right but in one sense uh we are finite beings and we have to work with the information that we have mm -hmm. in fact this is one of the one of the existential predicaments of humanity <laughs> that we have to constantly take big decisions on finite information you could even <laughs> say insufficient information right so right now we are facing the pandemic mm -hmm. now which medicines will work for the pandemic is the vaccine going to work mm -hmm. or not is a booster shot going to work for not do we mm -hmm. need vaccines for the children now we just know mm -hmm. it's such a crisis that we don't have time to do the exhaustive research spend we keep time for multiple years and then come right. to decision for that matter if so many areas in our life say if, if somebody decides to get married how mm -hmm. much can you really know about the other person before mm -hmm. you get married when you choose right. a career right. how much can we know about that career we said this career is very promising right now but maybe 5 years down the line by the time i graduate this career may not be that promising mm. so in general in no area of life do we ever get a comprehensive explanation for everything so, so in true. science this is called as the problem of resolution the problem of resolution means that how precise is the information that i need for functioning mm. for functioning in my life say if my car is showing this car speed is i'm moving at the, say 70 miles per hour so now 
is it okay if it is 70 point not 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 one <laughs> right if i had a meter which was going to show me 70 point not 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 one how big would the meter be <laughs> and then at what resolution do i stop mm. so you know is there a purpose for it right yeah we, we, so, we, so it's like how to put it that no we evaluate a, a particular design in terms of its purpose right that means the purpose of my the speedometer on the car is not to give me a precise speed down to maybe 10 decimals below zero mm. after mm. the point okay mm. i just don't want to go beyond the speed limit i want to make sure that i have control over my car mm. so like that in every area of life we operate with a certain level of information right nobody can have complete comprehensive information of anything at all so that's just the reality of our existence so similarly with respect to karma we don't have a complete understanding of say which action which life led to which which particular positive or negative situation in this life but overall we understand some principles and those principles can empower us that's really a good point even for me to hear because you know many times you you try to listen to even bhagavad stories even hindu scriptural stories you hear stories that this happened in this life and then this happened in the next life and sometimes you think uh it maybe doesn't match up to our expectation of what it what is what it's meant to be it doesn't seem balanced sometimes and it's nice to reflect on this that karma is not fully graspable it's not meant to be that we dissect every single angle uh to the minutia so that we can feel satisfied in ourselves that oh yes now it you know it all balances out perfectly so it's an important uh, acceptance in life to it's almost like a bit of humility that okay we have to accept that there's some explanation maybe not the complete explanation and maybe that can help right. us into the next phase of this conversation on how to then therefore remove ourselves from just being able blindly or maybe apathetically stating that everything is because of your karma usually we we kind of box people in according to their karmas <laughs> and yes. uh, the tendency can be to become a little bit uh you know uncompassionate apathetic, unkind heartless, apathetic yeah. so it's very very uh, very an issue that i find that some people would find as a criticism of this philo- um the karmic theory agreed agreed that's uh, unfortunately that has happened but, but we need to always separate see the uh, the philosophy from its application not separate completely but we can't always evaluate the merits of a philosophy by evaluating the ways in which it is it has been applied mm. if that were the sole criteria then you can say that why not apply sure. it to science mm. why not apply it to technology say we can say whatsapp is used to incite riots the internet is used to <laughs> uh if you as internet was so used true. by terrorist organizations to yeah. spread hate it Our is social media causes somebody. people to commit suicide yeah yeah so do we evaluate the merit of the technology based on its performance itself we never do that mm. you know if we say that say if we had not in the, invented the weapons of mass destruction <laughs> the, we are even technologically advanced weapons No, neither like world COVID. war 1 nor world war 2 would have neither world war 1 or world war 2 would have been that bad right even terrorists say then 911 they attacked the uh, they brought down the twin towers mm. if we didn't have tech, if we didn't have airplanes we they wouldn't have been able right. to bring down the twin towers right so we never <laughs> blame technology we say no it's the ideology of the people who did those things we mm. blame the nazis we blame ex- we blame extra religious extremism whatever it is so technology is a tool hmm. how you apply a tool is up to a people so similarly ultimately philosophy is also a tool you can have the most meaningful philosophy which can be applied in the most self serving way the most right. meaningful philosophy the most say for example medical knowledge medical knowledge can actually do so much good to people Mm. but sometimes even in the especially when medical knowledge mixed mix with the pharma industry then they may not let certain cures which are cheap and widely available spread 
Right. Because that'll that'll interrupt their money. So mm. does that make medicine itself bad? Does that mean medical industry itself bad? No. Not necessary. So, so similarly, yes. Let's look at the karma philosophy and then looks look at how it is been applied. So one misapplication could be that when a person is a victim, person is suffering, and you just tell them that you are suffering because of your past karma. Just accept mm. it and live with it. Mm. And now, yes, that could be an application, but. is this kind of application ever done in the scriptures Mm-mm. if you look at it if you look at the mahabharat so draupadi is grievously dishonored mm-hmm. by duryodhan by karna by dushasan now after that whole incident does anyone tell draupadi <laughs> do sorry you frozen again your karma there is a very important balancing point Can you hear Sorry, me? Sorry, I lost you there in the middle. Just if you could repeat the last. Yeah, so, so I said that nobody says when Draupadi is suffering that it's her karma, mm. because within that same tradition, the there is the philosophy of karma, but there is also an emphasis on dharma. Mm. Dharma is duty, the right thing to do. So whenever somebody is suffering, at that time, the emphasis is not on. what was the kar- their karma because of which they are suffering <laughs> the emphasis is on what is it, my dharma in this situation right wow so beautiful it is my dharma that is important mm-hmm. and that is why say when sita is abducted ram doesn't think oh it must sita must have done some bad karma because of which she is abducted now <laughs> he thinks that what is my dharma right now mm. she is my wife i have to protect her so he goes and wages a war and then we we hear many incidents in the ramayana as well as the mahabharat when citizens come and complain to the king oh these thieves are robbing us this injustice is happening the king doesn't tell the citizens your own karma <laughs> now very good point if the king started saying that then the king would be failing in their own dharma hmm so there are two things so the, so in one sense i always say that the philosophy is karma is not for post mortem it is for prognosis <laughs> not okay. for post mortem means not when something has happened you look back okay why what this what, what must this person have done because of which they got this wow good That's, point it's yes it's never talked like in those terms it's it's not meant to be talked in those terms mm. see if you consider in the vedic tradition it said that five kinds of people need to be protected so that children need to be protected the elderly need to be protected the cows need to be protected mm. uh, women need to be protected and uh, the saintly people the brahmana need to be protected mm. now in a, each of these they each of these they are very important for society but each right. of these they have certain vulnerabilities so old people their bodies are weak they they cannot protect themselves mm. now, so now you could use the same philosophy and say oh you have become old because of your own bad your own karma only <laughs> so why protect them why mm. is there a duty to protect at all so it is not karma is somebody else's karma is never meant to justify my abandonment of my dharma wow mm. and if you see that that way indian culture was always known for hospitality atithi devo bhava is it that mm. even when the european colonizers came to india even before that when islamic people who came later became invaders mm. they were always warm and welcoming Mm. and the idea was that nobody should nobody should go hungry now i'm not saying that indian culture was extremely exceptional in that in the past across various cultures also the welcoming attitude was there mm. but the point as making indians could say oh you know if you are hungry and you are starving it's your own karma mm. they would never think like that no. yeah. i've lost you again prabhu what is my dharma right So what is my dharma really right sorry now? Sorry about this. The emphasis no, on I'm karma. No, I'm sorry. I, it could be mine. Yeah, the emphasis on. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're back. Okay, good. Thank you. So the emphasis on karma is never to abandon one's dharma. That's a very important principle. So right. if somebody has applied it like that, that is a terrible misapplication. That is not how it is meant to be. It is not meant to make us heartless. There are many examples right. of kings. who are ready to sacrifice even their own lives to protect citizens so right that that's the understanding it's, it's not meant to be a misapplication so so i like what you said about it it's, it's a tool for prognosis no, yeah. and not for post mortem 
meaning we don't use it as like oh what you have done in the past now it's your fault so just uh, bear it yeah. don't complain don't be a burden to me <laughs> essentially saying don't tell me what to do and how to help you uh but so so if we could just maybe expand a little bit more about on the prognosis part so then how can okay, we feel more empowered question. okay so prognosis part see there's one part i will say about this karma that that individual when they face a terrible situation they may say oh it must be some karma i have done in the past because of which i am suffering so yes. there is a certain level of acceptance of the unavoidable that is required for all of us so take the same example of a citizen who comes and tells say in the mahabharat for the pandavas brahmana says i have been i am being robbed what are you kshatriyas doing you are not protecting me so if a citizen is being robbed by the king or robbed by by thieves and the citizen comes to the king and the king needs to endeavor to find the, to catch the thief and get the things back mm. but if sometimes the thief just runs away and the king cannot catch it then that person can accept okay maybe this was my own karma let me accept it mm. so that means after we have done our dharma if something doesn't work that time we can accept okay this is let me accept this as my karma from the past say if a mother has a child who is crying now would any mother anywhere even the mother has complete faith in the philosophy of karma will the mother say oh this child is crying because of the child's own past karma let the child keep crying <laughs> no nobody will do that <laughs> right. not if i the mother thinks what is my dharma what is my duty right Mm. now the mother will do everything to comfort the child if the child is sick to cure the child mm. but sometimes the child may be having some disease which may take some time to cure when you take some time to diagnose also for that matter so mm. at that time after the parents have done their part mm. after the parents yeah. have done their part then if the disease is not being cured the child is still in distress then they can mix it maybe there is some karma over here Let me accept this. So, right. just saying everything is karma. That way, you can say. Then, why would the Vedic tradition even develop the whole system of Ayurveda? Everybody <laughs> who falls sick, falls sick because of their past karma. So, let everybody suffer mm. their karma. Mm. But they've developed one of the most sophisticated systems of medicine in the world. Ayurveda is becoming more and more recognized now as non-intrusive with far less side effects. Mm. So, why would this be developed at all? so that's the part of this for after we have done our part if sometimes things don't come about then we can say it's karma we do our dharma after that but not before that uh, it so goes back to the, the prognosis it, part is which yeah go ahead i like i like this point a lot so i just want to restate it that it comes back to the point you said earlier that out of the three choices if you if you consider it random chance or uh, arbitrary uh, god it's the last one accepting that there's something kar like karma in the final stages after we've done our dharma if we accept the idea of karma then it becomes empowering because in that state like you're yes. saying if the if the mother is seeing the child still crying after everything they've done if there's no logical explanation that is to be accepted in our you know in our consciousness then it's very disempowering but if that if at that point when we're going through something regardless of all of our efforts to avoid that suffering if at that point we can really surrender and and understand okay maybe previously i did something and now how can i get out of that that is an empowering a uh, state to be in and and i i like that we kind of connected the two yes, it's like hard. that story on about dharmaraj the bull uh in, in bhagavatam that's very famous so when he is yeah. you know yeah. three legs are chopped off maybe yeah. you can just uh, and how he goes on to say that maybe it's this thing maybe it's kala maybe it's this maybe he's never saying that oh this person he doesn't point the finger at the person who's chopping off his legs yes see that is beautiful metaphor as we're going to come to that later so you anticipated Achha. what i'm going oh, to say oh sorry beautiful good no no good good we are you know we are thinking very similarly then so uh -huh. the point i was making is that see in that this incident is what when maharaj parikshit hears that kali's influence is spreading across his kingdom he starts going out as a vigilant king to see 
and then he comes to a place where there is a person dressed in black who is beating a cow and harass beating a bull has broken three legs of the bull and is harassing a cow at one level this whole conversation can seem absurd mm. because when parikshit maharaj comes he asks oh bull what is the cause of your suffering now the bull could can't you see this man is beating me isn't it obvious <laughs> to you yes. so it's it, it, this is an obvious question so so mm. why are you asking such a question to me that's a, and mm. so first of all he doesn't he doesn't post so it is a ask like that and he he doesn't even point, say you know this is the person who caused this he goes into a philosophical explanation i say mm. actually the cause of suffering is very difficult to understand so the bhagavatam is actually so he bhagavatam is actually analyzing causality at multiple levels so the immediate causality is obvious the immediate causality mm. this man is causing it so yes. after uh, after after the bull says oh i don't know what causes it now parikshit maharaj doesn't say okay so kali you didn't cause it you can go and do whatever you want he hmm. still disciplines kali he is about to punish kali so the immediate cause so he says to the bull that is dumb you you must be dharmaraj because you have the wisdom to see beyond the immediate immediate wow. cause that is your wisdom but he doesn't dismiss the immediate cause and say okay you are not responsible he is ready to punish even kill kali sorry it's breaking up prabhu uh, so, so so i'm just going to repeat what i think i am hearing the... yes it broke up in the middle of it well so so what, what what i heard is that you're saying that uh maharaj parikshit doesn't just say that uh well you know i i forgive kali for for doing this atrocious atrocious action he's saying that that is your wisdom that you are able to see more causality than just this one action that's happening now and and maybe that maybe that's empowering uh, so that's why he calls him dharmaraj you must be dharmaraj because you're working on a much deeper level of philosophy than just this immediate uh, action that's taken against you yeah exactly is that what you're saying yeah perfect perfect so we are not when we talk about the philosophy of karma we are not blind to the immediate cause hmm? can mm-hmm. you hear me yeah we are not blind to the immediate cause but neither are we blinded by the immediate cause to everything else mm the two extremes i don't see the immediate right. cause at all or i see only the immediate cause and i don't see anything else hmm so causality itself is little complicated i'll give a simple example to illustrate this from daily life can i share my screen you're okay yeah so this is this is you can call it the frame of reference in which we position situations so consider an event the event is say this is actually i had attended a seminar on i participated in the conference on spirituality and mental health so one girl in america she had told the story of how she went into depression so this mm-hmm. one evident that incident that happened to her that she was she was studying in university and she was also uh she was also waiting tables to get some money by the way mm. by the side so she was serving a client and the glass slipped from her hand this mm. was the event oh no that glass slipped off my hand now this simple event can be explained in various ways mm. okay. why did the glass slip okay you know the glass had just been washed and washed glasses are slippery so mm. in the future let me be careful as if the glass had just come from the sink then i should make sure that it is it is dry hmm? so that could be one cause mm. so then another cause could be that okay that customer screamed at me and that disturbed me and that's how the glass slipped out of my hand so some customers are like that i shouldn't get too disturbed by them that could be another explanation why right? the glass maybe the script person the patient the customers misbehavior had agitated me the mm. third could be i was walking along this area the floor was slippery over there so next time when i walk around that area i have to be careful or i should get this i should ask the manager to get this floor fixed the floor is uneven mm. over there or it could be that you know okay i you know i'm not the i'm not particularly handy at physical work maybe i, I need if i need a job i have to look at something else mm. Mm. so now which of these explanations is useful it depends on context 
Hmm. Simple and simple, like slipping the uh, slipping of a glass from a hand. So she told, she was telling how if we choose the long, wrong frame of reference. Actually, this was my explanation after she gave her talk. That she said hmm. that at that time she started thinking, if I can't carry even a glass of water, hmm. how am I going to manage my life? I'm a worthless oh. person. Oh, Krishna. Now, how many of us have actually had a glass of water slip from our hands? Probably everyone. How many of us thought that my life is useless because of that? Mm. That, is a, that is a very unhealthy frame in which to place that incident. Mm. So the idea is every incident can be placed in different frames. Right. In different frames. Frames means, by frame I mean a cause-effect connection. A causal mm. window, a cause-effect window. Why did the glass slip from my hand? Because I am an incompetent fool. That is a very unhealthy mm. explanation. Mm. So, so, so basically, there are many boxes, and in many ways, when people have mental health, mental health problems, they are placing the events of their life in unhealthy boxes. Mm -hmm. In unhealthy boxes. So, if somebody has a breakup, and then they just sink into depression. Well, that might happen because they would think because of that one breakup, I think nobody is going to love me. I'm unlovable. I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life. Okay. Does that have to be the explanation that you have to resort to? Maybe the two of us didn't get along together. Maybe there is something for me to learn. But that doesn't make me unlovable if there's something I need to learn more. So basically, why, why I'm, this itself is a big subject of mental health. But the point I'm making is that yeah. one sign of mental health is to be able to place events in the most constructive frame of reference to find the right. most constructive causal explanation for an event. Mm. Now, which of these are true? Well, many could be true. The glass was slippery. Even the customer had screamed at me. The floor was uneven. And I am not suited for the for physical work so much. All of these could be true. But right I've lost you again. Now, huh? which is the most constructive explanation for me? So, right. which is the explanation I, I can act on right now? Mm -hmm. That is the most constructive explanation. So, similarly, right. with respect to karma, karma basically is meant to give us one more causal framework in which to place the events. But that should never be the only framework. Mm. That should not be the only framework in which you put the events. Wow. So if we start doing that, then that will be injurious. And that is not the, you could say almost, if somebody is doing that, that is not the problem with the philosophy of karma. We could say that, that is almost the problem of the mental health of that person. Mm -hmm. It is a sign of mental health, mental ill health. Right. To place events in a, in a, in a disempowering framework. In a exactly. disempowering framework. So if, I, I, is this point, I hope it made it clear, reasonably clear I, I, what I'm trying to say? I really appreciate it because it's actually tying in so many uh, little ends that we may not actually connect. Because just like in the earlier example that you gave of a mother and a child crying, if in that moment she says, I'm just a useless mother, you know, this, uh, this, or, or she starts feeling yeah. ill feelings towards a child, this child is such a burden, you know, it's giving me so much. You, you, it's all about framework and actually like, understanding the wisdom in that moment is so crucial for our mental health for our experience of reality itself and that's uh, i can appreciate that back to the story of dharmaraj and parikshit maharaj that it the most empowering situation would be to say okay what can i do what can i do to change the situation because this other person is not going to change yes so, that I find really empowering. Um, yes. If it's okay, if we can move into how the, the, the title of today was freeing ourselves from karma. Yes. You know, so if we can maybe highlight that, is there an escape? Because in one hand, yes, it's empowering um, to kind of fix bad situations. But on the other hand, action also gives us joy and pleasure. So karma karma itself okay. is is uh, is you know responsible for our happiness and our distress 
So why is this, there's this idea that we have to free ourselves of karma itself. Why is it okay. uh, said that it's binding? Okay, so the word, yeah, right, good point. So karma is in the action natural for us. So mm -hmm. why do we have to free ourselves from karma? So here we have to, you know, again, I said there are two meanings of the word karma. Right. Karma is action and karma is reaction. So when we are saying free ourselves from karma, it doesn't mean give up all action. Right. It means free ourselves from the reactions of karma. Hmm. So act in a way that we won't get entangled by further reactions. The two are really different. So that's we, it's not that we give up karma entirely. That's just not possible. Hmm. Like some right. people say that you know do you do no work, just give up all work. But actually, we, even if we give up all work, we are still thinking. Yes, still, our brains are working, our bodies are digesting food. Nobody can give up work entirely. Mm -hmm. Somebody says, give up all desires. Well, even wanting to give up all desires is also a desire. It's a very powerful desire. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So we can't do that in one sense. So it's more of, you could say, freeing ourselves from karma means it's a more a matter of alignment or purification. Mm -hmm. So purification or alignment, the two are very similar. Alignment means so we are all parts of a reality far bigger than ourselves. Mm -hmm. And each of us has our part to play within that bigger picture, with that bigger reality. And to the extent we are aligned with that bigger picture, with that bigger purpose, to that extent, we become free from karma what does wow. it mean free from karma free from karma means we are not culpable for our actions mm -hmm. so when first we'll talk a little extreme example then we come to ordinary examples that say if somebody breaks the uh, traffic rules and they go through where above the speed limit or they go break through when there's a red signal they are culpable mm -hmm. they're culpable they'll be punished but suppose Somebody is an ambulance driver and they are mm -hmm. having an emergency. Now, what is happening is if they are rushing, they may even go above the speed limit, they may even break through the red signal and they will not be punished for that. Mm -hmm. Because that ambulance driver is not just if it's their own desire, I just want to have fun and go mm -hmm. very fast. Well, even ambulance drivers, they have rules. You cannot just flout all the rules if you don't have an emergency patient. Yeah. For normal drives, you cannot break the rules. But when they are working as a part of something bigger than themselves, mm. then the normal rules may not apply. Then mm. they are not culpable. Now, that doesn't mean that they, they neglect and reject the rules. It is just right. that they are not culpable. They are not held mm. guilty. Okay. So, so the traffic rules are important and traffic rules are to be followed. But if one is fulfilling a bigger purpose, then one doesn't become implicated by karma. Mm -hmm. So similarly, the idea is that we are all parts of Krishna. And if we start doing our work in a mood of service to Krishna, mm -hmm. so uh, then whatever we do, that will not lead to karmic bondage. That will not lead to karmic implications. Right. So we could say that the three levels of working with respect to traffic, I mentioned this last time, that mm -hmm. I just drive along the road and I don't care for the traffic rules at all. Mm -hmm. I'm going to soon going to get in trouble. For right. some time, I might escape. I saw once a cartoon that the person was speeding way above the limit. Mm -hmm. And then the cop pulled him over. He said, didn't you see the speed? Didn't you see the speed limit? Sign. Says, this person says, I saw the sign. I just didn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Oh, yeah. So that means sometimes it will say that if there's nobody watching me, I can break the speed limit and go. Mm. And you can go for some time, but eventually you'll get caught. Right. So that way, somebody may break the traffic rules for some time, but sooner or later they'll get caught. So mm -hmm. breaking the traffic rules itself is V karma. Hmm? Mm. It is karma, viruddha rupena karma. It right. is karma which will give us bad results. Mm -hmm. Then working according to traffic rules is karma. Mm -hmm. Hmm? That is, yes, I'm going to whatever destination I want to go, but I'm following the traffic rules and going. Right. Then the government is not going to interfere with us. The government will, in one sense, facilitate the make by maintaining sure the rules are, roads are good. But the government is not going to assist us. 
But if somebody is working in the working in the medical industry and they're an ambulance, they're working on behalf of the government, mm. then even the normal rules may be suspended. Wow. So there is V karma, there is karma, and there is a karma. Right. So a karma is action that does not produce any reaction. And that is like a, as a doctor, uh, medic, uh, ambulance driver working. Mm. They, they, they may temporarily go beyond the traffic rules for a higher purpose. Mm. So the Gita encourages us from wherever we are to rise higher. So if from V karma, we come towards karma. Mm -hmm. From karma, we go towards a karma. A karma means, so at one level, Arjuna could fight because I'm a Kshatriya. Mm -hmm. And I need a kingdom to rule. And these people have stolen my kingdom. And I had to get the kingdom back. If he fought at that level, he would still be right. He would be doing karma. Mm -hmm. Be doing karma. But the Gita guided Arjuna to fight. Not just you have to gain your kingdom. Actually, Krishna says, I have come here to this world to establish dharma. Mm -hmm. And you be my instrument. Nimitta matram bhava savvesachi. In 1133, Krishna tells Arjuna that you become my instrument. So your purpose is not just to make Yudhishthira the king. Your purpose is not just to gain entry into the royal palace. After gaining your entry there, your position there, you will work on my behalf. You will serve me. You will, mm -hmm. you will be a part of my mission for bringing about order in the right. world. Right. So if somebody works like that, then it is a karma. So mm -hmm. broadly speaking, if we are to become free from the bondage of karma, it is best we move toward a karma. Now, karma means we work, whatever work we are doing in our lives, like professional, familial, social, we do it in a mood of service to Krishna. Now, how exactly we can uh, reconceptualize or re-execute mm -hmm. our various roles in society, our various... Okay, sorry. So Sorry, I lost okay. you again. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Back. Yes. So I was saying that how we can reconceptualize all our work, how we can do all our work as a form of service to Krishna, mm -hmm. that is taught in Bhakti Yoga. And Bhakti Yoga involves learning from a guru, learning from the association of sad, uh, Vaishnavas, of devotees, Bhaktas. Satsang is very important. Mm -hmm. so, but that is, broadly speaking, free, becoming free from karma means to work as a seva to Krishna, to work mm -hmm. in a mood of service to Krishna. That is the ultimate way you can become free, free from karma. And broadly by aligning with the rules of morality and legality, we can at least become free from vikarma. Mm -hmm. So vikarma to karma, we can come by following the broad rules of morality. And from karma to a karma, we can come by practicing bhakti. So one yeah. might question that, do we need God to become free from karma? Like um why would god have created a system in which we get bound up yeah good question do we need karma god to become free see god reciprocates with our desires mm. so ultimately the world is created for us to have facility for fulfilling our desires mm. we have various desires and the world is created for fulfilling those desires. So imagine it's like a vast amusement park. And in each amusement park, the children who are playing. A child can go on a slide. A child can go into a tunnel. A child can go on a merry-go-round. A child can go on a right. various kinds of things. Each of them, each of them, you could say, have their own rules. Mm -hmm. If you go up on a giant wheel, you cannot jump off from there. There will be straps around you. You have to follow those rules. So you could say the whole world is like a giant amusement park. Now in the amusement park, if we are following the rules, we can have a good time. And there are many, many things which you can keep doing. Right. But the child says, I played enough now. I just want to go back home. I start looking for the mother, father. And then the, the, the parents are there and take the child back home. So we could say the world is like a giant amusement park in which that there are various things we can try out mm -hmm. and for trying out how, what how much can we try out there are two things one is our desire and the other is our karma mm -hmm. so what do you want which 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 of the 
which of the things in the amusement park you want to try out. That's one thing based on your decide. But then how much money does the child have to play? So we take, take the expand further. When the child is, there are some places the child can even earn money. Mm. So there is karma. Karma is our, our here it's the past karmic credits. So the world is arranged in such a way that it facilitates our desires. So if we do good things, we will get to a better place in the world. But there is a difference between, you could say, religious and spiritual. There's a difference between ritual and spiritual. Mm. So ritual is broadly speaking what we might say as good karma. That will give us a better condition in life. Now, of course, right. the word ritual today has a negative connotation because you're doing something mindlessly. Mm. But the original idea of ritual is that if we do something which is prescribed by tradition, prescribed by scripture, prescribed by culture, and it is considered normally to be a good thing. Not all mm. rituals today are good things. But the idea mm. of ritual is there are certain good activities we do and they will give us good results in the future. That's right. ritual. Mm. But just doing good things is not going to take us out of this world. Good right. thing, Doing good things will take us to a better place in this world. So if you want to get ultimately free from the world, okay, I don't want to play in this world at all anymore. I want to play in this MSP. I want to say, where's my mom? Where's my dad? I want to go back to them. Go back with mm -hmm. them. So that's why there is a karma which is uh, recommended in the Bhagavad Gita ultimately. Not just karma, but a karma. Mm -hmm. Does that address well, the question? Yes, it, it really does. Um, I, in the sense that it, it, it helps analyze why we are continuing in the cycle. It's, a, it's our own choice. I like the point that you're pointing out. We, Krishna has created this to facilitate our desires. Karma is not an yes. oppressive force. It's not like because many times we get the idea that we are bound by the karma. But, but actually what you're highlighting is that it's our own desire. We are here uh, enjoying the fruits of our labor. And the moment that we give up that control and that need for enjoyment, we can kind of, uh, when, like you said, when you're done, when the child is done and says, okay, now I want to look for my parents, I'm done with this amusement park. <laughs> then when, you, when, you're, uh, when we let go and uh, decide, then we can move more into the spiritual realm. Maybe yes, from the perfect. ritual, then we get into the spiritual aspect of. Uh, so maybe we can just uh, uh, unpack that a little bit more. There's another question here as well, yeah. similar. That yeah, let me what is this question? Yeah. Can yeah. you explain I'll, 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 how, what you mentioned? I'll just complete that if you don't mind. What yes, is about karma? You know, so let's take an example. Say a person has gone from their home to a different kingdom, different city, mm -hmm. different country, different kingdom, and mm -hmm. now. Uh, you talk about karma bind. Does karma bind? Why do we say karma binds? Mm. It's, karma is basically a system of cosmic accountability. Cos mm. account we are accountable for our actions. That's the essence of karma. So say somebody goes from, say, somebody comes from India to uh, UK. And now, if after coming to UK, they start breaking all the laws over there. Mm. Then they'll put in the jail. Then mm. what happens is they're restricted. They're restricted. Right. Now, there are different mm. kinds of jails also. Somebody right. might be put in a jail where they're highly restricted. Somebody might be put in a... There are, there are relatively... If somebody is educated, they can do some good contribution, even the jail. They might be put in a relatively more comfortable jail. Mm. Now somebody says, okay, you, you can go to home, but you cannot leave this geographical area. Right. You're under parole, parole, something like that. Then somebody may be told, okay, you can go wherever you want, but you have to give us an account of your activities. Mm. So we could say that, a the person is always under the jurisdiction of the country's laws. But mm. how much do the country's laws control them depends on how they have acted in the past. Right. So if a person has a very bad criminal record, the country's laws will, in one sense, as you said, seem oppressive. You mm. cannot even go out of the cell. Mm. Because if you, have been, if you have been behaving badly, even in a jail, then you may put in the same solitary confinement. So like that, what happens is karma, it restricts, but there are degrees of restriction. Right. That's beautiful. Can you hear me? So somebody has done a lot of negative karma. They may have a lot of, okay. yeah. Somebody has done a lot of bad karma in the past, negative karma, then basically their facilities will be restricted a lot. Mm -hmm. So one way would be they may be born in a very poor family. 
they may not have a healthy body they mm-hmm. may have very low iq they mm-hmm. may be born in a country there's a lot of political instability or they, they cannot even be very free to move around so there are different degrees of bondage and separate different degrees of restriction so if somebody has done good karma they may not even perceive much restriction you know okay mm. i have good intelligence i work hard i do well in my career is born in a good family i had a good upbringing i'm doing well in my life mm-hmm. so then what is the limitation for them for, for them also the limitation is ultimately that you all have to grow old you have to get diseased you have to die and then we have to be reborn so the right. limitations their their circles may vary may vary right. but ultimately everybody the the biggest limitation that karma puts us in is that as long as we are under karma we are in the domain of this temporary world mm. we are eternal beings and we are seeking pleasure and fulfillment in temporary things so that is something which is an existential predicament so mm. only when we start seeking the eternal we start turning towards the lord that's when we go beyond the jurisdiction of karma okay beautiful right there what would you just said that we are we are eternal beings seeking pleasure in a temporary world and that is the basic yes. pre- pre- predicament and to get out of it we must turn to bhakti like you talked about alignment to completely get out of a uh, maybe uk you use the con- you know country example you would need to have a passport for another world <laughs> another country so that passport yes. is is kind of like a, you know bhakti this is krishna's creation and um he has that capacity to take us out of this karmic very broad uh, you know boundaries that you're you're explaining janma mrityu jara vyadi like birth death old age and disease no matter how karmically fortunate we are we will all have to go through those that cycle and take birth again which is very uh, non desirable to say the least so if we can maybe come to this point about bhakti how much and maybe what are the nuances of how does bhakti take away the karma um okay so the idea is that bhakti helps us. ultimately karma is not just a system for accountability hmm it's ultimately a system to promote spirituality i'll explain what i mean by this is see if somebody has done something wrong and they are put in the jail or they are put in some kind of situation i just change the question slightly because somebody else has asked a relevant question to what you are answering so go ahead so it's not just accountability go on sorry i didn't mean to disrupt okay yeah so person is put in a jail they may say that okay for this crime you have to be 5 years in jail but the purpose of the justice system is not just to incarcerate the criminal for 5 years if the right. criminal is behaving very responsibly is is maybe learning some life skills by which they can get a better life outside maybe in 3 years they may be allowed to come out mm-hmm. isn't it so yeah. if that happens in our justice systems then what to speak of the divine justice system right so the point is that the more we align with the ultimate purpose of life with the purpose of god for the world then we may have done some negative karma in the past but mm. the purpose of the karmic system is not just to that every single action you have done you have to get the punishment for that mm. no that's not the point the mm. point is to prompt us to become more and more aligned so when wow. krishna says sarva dharman parityajya mam ekam sharanam braja aham twam sarva papebhyo mokshayishyami ma shucha ha wow so he's saying that the point is if you become fully aligned with me then okay whatever karma might happen might have happened in the past whatever karma might might you think might happen in the future i'll take care of that mm-hmm. so that's how in one sense sometimes he says bhakti burns our past karma well burning is a very vivid metaphor mm-hmm. but the point is it you can say you can use the word burning but the point is the previous karma's action reactions are no they become redundant mm. they are no longer needed if once a person has become aligned why is that needed at all so in right. that sense <laughs> the bhakti burns away our past karma beautiful i think you've answered so many questions with just within those this, this tiny segment here that um, the point of karma is not just accountability it's not tit for tat god is not just yes, a definitely. vengeful kind of yeah. punishing lord 
he wants us to reunite. He wants us to align with his purpose of creation and purpose of our existence, uh, the purpose of our life and meaning. So as soon as we align, all the other, these are almost secondary, the karma and the dharma almost become secondary to the, the alignment itself. Yes, that's very good. I think tit for tat is a good word. Rather uh-huh. than accountability, I think the word which came to my mind was now, after you used tit for tat, is retribution. Retribution, Karma is yes. not a retributive justice. Ah. So then you did this, so you have to get this. The right. purpose of karma is not retribution, it is reformation. Reformation. If, if you're reformed, then there's no need for retribution anymore. Right. Beautiful. Uh, so so uh, maybe just slightly more on uh, unpacking this one. Can it burn out our, you know, experiences? How much, how much does bhakti burn out? Okay. How much does bhakti burn our, say, currently experienced karmas? See, firstly, it's not mathematical. Life, life is not mathematical, you know. Okay, we can't even quantify how much karma do I have? How much karma does this particular thing cause? We can get a broad understanding. So it's not exactly mathematical. Ultimately, it's personal. It's reciprocal. It's mm. Krishna wants us to align with him. So it's a matter of developing a relationship with him. So whatever is favorable for the development of our relationship with Krishna, what we can call as our spiritual evolution, that is what Krishna ultimately arranges through the system of karma. Wow. So Will a devotee, even somebody who's practicing bhakti, go through some sufferings? Well, yeah. The, it's not that the world's nature is going to change. If there's mm. going to be a storm, whether somebody's a devotee or not a devotee, both of them are going to be inconvenienced. Both of them are going to be threatened. Mm. So at a material level, we can't. bhakti doesn't promise that the events happening at the material level will themselves be changed. So there's mm. some amount of inconvenience, some amount of distress will come. But what Bhakti gives us is a higher vision of what is happening in our lives. So one way I put it is that uh, the world's power to hurt is immense. It can hurt us in many different ways. But greater than the world's power to hurt is God's power to heal. Mm. Is God's power to heal. So bhakti right. doesn't stop the, bhakti doesn't ensure that the world will no longer hurt us. But bhakti will give us access to God's power to heal. So the key difference between somebody who is aligned with the Lord and somebody who is not yet aligned with the Lord. What is the difference? It is not that the world will no longer hurt them. The world's hurts are going to come on everyone. But it's like a compared to people in a hospital, they are in adjacent beds and both of them are in pain. Because they have a painful disease. Mm. But person A, their disease has been diagnosed accurately and a potent treatment has been prescribed. Mm. And person B, their the disease has not been diagnosed and various kinds of experimental tri- treatments have been tried out. Nothing seems to be working. So at present, A and B both are in a state of distress. Right. <laughs> but their future is very different. Mm. A is a person whose disease is going to be con- controlled and cured. Their pain is going to dis- decrease and disappear. B, their disease may worsen. Their pain may also worsen. So that is the difference between somebody who is a devotee, who is a bhakta, somebody who is aligned with the Lord and somebody who is not yet aligned with the Lord. So wow. the present experiences may not change. But mm-hmm. what is what is going to emerge through the present experiences may change. Both are deceased. So both will have some suffering. But right. The Bhakta is one who has understood, okay, what's wrong in my life ultimately and how can I set it right? So the diagnosis has been done, the prescription mm. has been accepted. The future yeah. is very bright because of that. Beautiful. Yeah, you explained very succinctly, like Prarabdha Karma may not change, but your, you know, Bija and Kuta, like there's some technical terms, you may not be inclined anymore to make those same uh, bad karmic uh, actions. But Yes. Externally, externally, the bhakta and the abhakta would look the same. You know, it, we're all going to be going through sufferings. And in fact, the reduction of suffering is not the goal of, of the alignment with God. The reduction of suffering. Because, you know, in one sense, it's just <laughs> the, the world is described as a place of suffering 
uh, in in all sense that we can imagine. Yeah, but that's true. So, so, yeah, I mean, it's a good point about reduction of suffering. I talk about this at five levels. If I will just take a few minutes about how what happens. Hmm. See, first is that once we start getting spiritual knowledge, at the very least, we stop creating future suffering for ourselves. Right. Why? Because I know. Okay. These are these are these are things which I do. It is going to like the prognosis aspect. Mm. So first is at least I know these things I should not do. So we stop creating future suffering for ourselves. So in that sense, it reduces suffering. Mm. Right. So the knowledge to make right choices. Mm. Second is sometimes in some situations we may have the knowledge to make the right choices, but somehow we are not able to muster the will to make the right choices. Mm. I know this thing is bad. Let's like keep doing it. What bhakti does is. it provides the inner strength the inner insight the higher taste as we call it mm. so as we get that higher taste the the habits which we wanted to leave but which were not leaving us mm. we also are able to get, become free from those so that also ensures that we are not creating any future suffering mm -hmm. the suffering because of ignorance suffering because of attachments ignorance right. leading to bad choices attachment leading to bad choices both these sufferings are reduced So it's two le level. Level one knowledge. Let the level two is you could say will power is increased. Mm -hmm. Then you can talk about level three is tolerance. Tolerance right. means that when I start understanding that I am a soul and I am on a multi life journey, so whatever bad thing is happening to me, I can see it from much bigger framework. I don't. I won't catastrophize it. This mm. is the end of the world for me. My life is over because you know this. As I said, this relationship didn't work out, or this job didn't work out, this interview didn't work out. My life oh. is over. No, 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 no. We are, we are for the long haul over here. So, just Krishna says that he talks about the Atma in the thirteenth verse of the second chapter, and immediately says the result of knowing the Atma is tam sitiksha sobharata tolerate. Oh. So, so one of my favorite examples for this is actually I gave this example on a class in. In Florida, and there was a devotee who was there in the class. He said, "I had this experience that mm. he says that there are some kind, some kind, sometimes some leeches. If somebody is going out in the forest or somewhere, and some leech just catches your leg, mm. and that leech is sucking the blood out. It's very scary to feel its tentacles going into the body. Ugh. And now sometimes what happens is that if you try to pull the leech out, it has such a strong grip." That it will rip the whole skin out, but it will not let go. Oh, Krishna! So we may say, "What do you do then?" Hmm. And the thing to do at that time is just let the leech drink the blood. Say, "How can I do that? It's drinking my blood." <laughs> but the thing is, the leech hmm. does not have an infinite capacity to drink blood. Right. Once it has drunk its capacity of blood, it will itself will fall off, or it will withdraw its leech, its its tentacles, and we can just flip it off. So. our karma comes like that it's mm. like a leech which is sucking blood but we understand that okay it's going to suck certain level of blood but not mm -hmm. beyond that right so tolerate while it is there it's not the end of the world mm -hmm. so whatever inevitable sufferings come we learn tolerance that is the third level mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so then the fourth level at which we are become better equipped is that we understand the meaning and purpose okay ultimately krishna has some plan for me so we learn to place our suffering in a constructive framework okay one is just all right it is there it will be there temporarily but i talked earlier about the framework mm -hmm. i can place this in a constructive framework right so shri prabhupad he tried in so many ways to try to build a big business so that he could have support his spiritual master's mission financially but none of his projects none of his businesses worked and then what happened was he was thinking when he had particularly devastating financial loss he experienced so one of one of his god brothers told him and he also read in the bhagavatam that this is krishna's special mercy <laughs> oh this krishna's special mercy when vidura was grievously insulted by the, the duryodhan No, it was a horrible insult. But what did the the Tarudra see? Oh, this is an opportunity for me to just leave this kingdom. Then mm -hmm. I won't have to fight against against Krishna. I don't have to fight for Duryodhan. <laughs> so it was a very painful thing, but he was able to see it positively. 
Mm-hmm. Now, this is what people often call as positive thinking, and it's very helpful. But the scripture doesn't us just help us to think positive; it actually gives us a positive vision of reality itself. And mm. There is a higher purpose. Mm. It is that there is a higher purpose over here, and we try to align ourselves with that. So that itself decreases suffering substantially. Mm-hmm. Because see, we do, we are not really nobody wants pain, but what we especially abhor. is pointless pain pointless pain yes absolutely. if i can see this is purposeful then okay i'll endure it nobody would like to be jabbed in their body but if they know mm-hmm. it's an injection which is going to or uh, is going to protect me from disease no okay i'll endure it mm-hmm. so that meaning get, giving us a sense of meaning and purpose at the fourth level of health that mm-hmm. itself reduces suffering a lot hmm? right so mm-hmm. suppose then the fifth level is what we what we discussing about is minimization see krishna ah. himself may minimize the suffering krishna like the government may reduce a five years old five year sentence to two and a half year sentence so mm-hmm. like that krishna can minimize the karma so sometimes what happens is we just focus on the fifth one and we think i'm practicing bhakti why is krishna not minimizing my karma mm-hmm. and if krishna is not minimizing my suffering what is the use of practicing bhakti does bhakti even work Mm-hmm. but if we focus only on that fifth dimension we are actually missing out on all these other four things so wow, we, i'll quickly summarize the first is would you like to summarize or you want to me to summarize five things no no uh, well okay. I, i don't remember them all in order no, so sure, i'll do that then I mean, i'll do it quickly so first i said is that the knowledge to not create further suffering knowledge mm-hmm. to make good choices second is the will to be able to make the good choices we know we should be doing but we are not able to do so mm-hmm. you can say purity bhakti purifies us and so one is knowledge second is purification third is tolerance a suffering has come is going to be temporary let's like leech example mm-hmm. the fourth is a meaningful vision mm-hmm. see meaning in suffering and the fifth is minimization of karma itself by krishna so in all these ways our suffering we we can deal with suffering better our suffering mm-hmm. does become minimized and whatever suffering remains we are able to deal with it better right it's almost like a transformation of the experience of suffering it's like the suffering yes. is still there but like you're saying our, our will power our um, in intellect all these extra support systems if we have in place yes. then then we can you know experience that suffering in a completely different way a completely yes. transformed way so it's like a superpower <laughs> it's kind of like having spiritual power to deal with that um yes. you really think very helpful those five points i'll try to write it out in the comments as well uh but but if we could just maybe take a slight detour which is very much related to this because we're talking right now about uh, aligning with krishna's will uh, you know mm. turning towards bhakti to in some sense transform our karma or reduce our karma um then what is to stop uh, you know how should we check ourselves from maybe using bhakti to be doing vikarma sometimes people may say i'm doing god's will you know in the name of god we shall do you know terrorism it could be anything it could be how do we know that uh something is truly god's will and how to okay. avoid are all kinds of deeds can anything be done in god's name <laughs> it seems okay it's a good question anything can be justified in god's name yeah so god's will that can be a very as you rightly said can become a rationalization for doing my will hmm. and i can claim that i'm doing god's will that is why there are multiple checks involved first of all the biggest check in my understanding is that the gita has two frameworks one is the devotional framework the bhakti framework and the other is the guna framework the guna is the three modes of material nature sattva mm. rajas and tamas so now this guna framework itself is complicated but let's put it in a simple way that what it means is that in tamo guna a person is completely misaligned with reality they can't even perceive physical reality or material reality properly mm. person say driving drunk they can't even see maybe they are so driving so drunk they can't uh, control the brakes they can't see who is coming along the way that is tamasik mm. Mm. so if somebody is their overall life is in tamoguna that means they are they are just 
they are abusive they are exploitative they are negligent uh, they are they, they are and suddenly that person says i am doing god's will well definitely you are far far misaligned from god's will so there is tamoguna which is extreme misalignment rajoguna is characterized by okay we are following the rules of the traffic to some extent mm-hmm. but it's all for my gain hmm i have nothing to do with the government i have nothing to do with any higher purpose in life but uh, i just want to get my own desires fulfilled so at in rajoguna one is perceiving material reality reasonably well but no spiritual reality practically speaking and one may accept some god or something like that as long as he doesn't interfere in my life i may worship him if he can help things better make things a little better for me but otherwise i have nothing to do with god so <laughs> rajoguna you could say is slightly greater alignment with reality at least a person is perceiving much perceiving much material reality so if you consider in terms of parenting say some parents maybe unfortunately you know they are themselves they may be depressed and they may be taking drugs and their children are hungry at home and they don't even care for them mm. that's terrible negligent parenting mm. Mm. then some parents may be like very 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 ambitious and they put a lot of pressure on their children and for them their children just become become means for fulfilling their desires an extension they provide a lot of comfort <laughs> sorry it's a, an extension of themselves how yes. to enjoy yeah they may work very hard and they may provide their children a lot of facilities also mm. but they are not really so they they're not really seeing the children holistically this is a person mm. different from me and what is this per- who is this actually what are their natural interests what are their talents mm. they, so a per- parent in rajoguna is much better than a per- parent in tamoguna no mm. doubt they are caring for the children and if the children child is sick or something like that you know they may even they may take mortgage on their own house and everything they may put for taking care of the children mm. but they want the children to conform to their idea of how who should be so you're not really seeing the child as a person in their own right then beyond that is satvaguna Mm-hmm. satva guna is where you know we see material reality and we also see spiritual reality is yes, this is the ch- is my child but is also a soul who has mm-hmm. their own past karma and that's why they have their own individuality so i cannot just expect this child to be my xerox copy mm-hmm. or just be an extension of my plan for my life mm-hmm. so that is satva guna so satva guna we can say we are little more aligned with who the person is Mm-hmm. so krishna actually is asked by arjuna this question if people claim to have faith he says that if people claim to have faith but how do we know what the level of their faith is anybody can claim i am doing god's will so krishna mm. says don't just accept their claims for faith of faith look at how they are living and he gives yeah. parameters for looking at whether the, how they are living in raj, whether their overall conduct is satva rajas or tamas Mm. and a person cannot be an instrument of god's will unless they are at least living in satva mm. at least to some extent in satva if a person is just indiscriminately shooting down anyone who oppo- killing anyone who opposes them person is intolerant a person is arrogant and maybe they have grabbed some religious authority somehow that person cannot be considered to be doing god's will at all Hmm. so if we so god's will is not just you know reading some statement from some religious text and thinking i'm going to do this or just uh, getting some authority in some religious organization and saying that they're doing god's will god's will has to be actually an alignment and that alignment has to be seen in our entire life hmm. so in that sense only when a person is steadily living in sattva and moving towards shuddha sattva that's when we can say that person is doing god's will that person mm-hmm. is living in raj largely living in rajas and tamas uh, tamas means completely ignorant of even material reality rajas means only possessive pursuing material reality then such people cannot really be said to be doing god's will and that's why nobody can in general we seen most saintly people like vishnu prabhupad he never claimed that when he came to the west he said i am doing krishna's will rather he said mm-hmm. i am doing my guru's will i am following my guru's instruction mm. so the idea is that we need other people around us to wow hold us accountable even when we are spiritually elevated in god's will 
so god's will is never meant to uh, meant to uh, meant to override our morality never meant to override our conscience never meant to override our con- our common sense our intelligence these are resources which god has provided all of us to some mm-hmm. extent so in exceptional situations very very exceptional situations god's will maybe go beyond all this but we look at krishna how he how he persuaded arjuna hmm. krishna did not tell arjuna this is my will just do it hmm. if that was his idea he could have com- completed the whole gita in six words i am god obey me fight <laughs> could have finished the gita in six words krishna did not do that hmm. krishna did what did arjuna to align with his will but how by training arjuna's intelligence by by reasoning with him hmm. so generally god's will builds on the resources for discernment that we have been given i'll right. repeat this we all have been given some resources for discerning what is the right thing to do mm. see one resource is our intelligence this product is advertised is so, a good product is it really ad good i use my intelligence we have common mm. sense we have our conscience conscience is something inside which this this doesn't, this doesn't seem to be good and then we have you could say broadly speaking the cultural moral codes and they are not always mm. right but there mm. are various resources available for us to discern what is the right thing to do mm. and god's will builds on this god's will is not just rejecting all this and this is god's will do it mm. so krishna doesn't have that mood you have your intelligence and i will respond to your question intelligently based on you your see. intelligence Ah, uh, help your intelligence to become convinced that aligning with my will is the best thing to do. Mm. That's why this is a very dangerous thing if people start claiming that I am doing God's will. Mm. Now, first, learn to follow your intelligence. First, learn to follow your conscience. First, learn to act in a responsible way in society. Mm. Then we can first come to Satva Guna. Then we can talk about God's will. Otherwise, if before that people are talking about I am doing God's will, that's a extremely dangerous thing to say. Hmm. beautiful well uh there's a lot of questions coming through uh but i think time is up so if we could i, I was just wanting to go a little bit towards uh just practical tips on daily daily life of freeing ourselves a little bit more you know because we talk about a karmic footprint as if it's a carbon footprint you know like if we That's recycle nice. if we plant more trees if we speak politely you know at least, at least in england it's a very big thing to be courteous and it's very important part of life is my my take on karma is that no matter how much we do it is not going to relieve us from the karma that that am i wrong in thinking that or is there a way that we can live a li- little bit more harmoniously and maybe just evade all the karmic pitfalls is it is it possible to just live with good sukriti good uh, you know good deeds good samaritan lots of philanthropy and just be happy in my life why do i need yeah. god yes see at one level from the mode of tamas or rajas coming to sattva is much better when bhakti nath thakur says even rajas is much better than tamas and the mm. mode of passion in many ways is much better than mode of ignorance like i talk about parenting mm. if, if a parent child has a very demanding expecting parent that's that's difficult mm. but in many ways that is better than having a completely negligent parent or absent yes. parent so in that sense i would say that anybody who rises from the mode they are in even a little step higher mm. they will make their life better and they will help make the world better Right. Even if a significant minority of people rise towards the mode of goodness, mm. we all can help make the world a better place. So, like say, for example, the issue of our climate change and the environmental consciousness that we are cultivating. Mm. Yes, now we we may not have the power to make big changes, but we all can become a little more conscious. Maybe spend a little more less fuel, a little more conscious about how much mm-hmm. we use electricity and small small things we can take care of. that's right. very helpful and that can help in small small ways so one uh, it's not to minimize if some if people are more philanthropic it's valuable we, we can't minimize or trivialize that right so anyone rising their mode rising up the mode is good 
So, but having said this, there is the understanding that ultimately for bhakti, some people say bhakti is exclusive. If you're not practicing bhakti, whatever you're doing is useless. Hmm. And uh, that there are examples given like that. Bhakti, bhakti is like one. Krishna is one. Everything else is zero. Yeah. But that is true philosophically. No doubt about it. But that is from the eternal perspective. Hmm. Not from the in this life's perspective. From this life's perspective, whether somebody is sattva or somebody is rajas or somebody is in tamas, that can make a big difference. Hmm. If the head of state, if the, if, if, uh, if the king hmm. or the president or the prime minister if they are tamoguna, you know, they are abusive and exploitative or negligent or whatever, they can make mm. their citizens' life hell. And then Rajas mm. or Sattva, they're good. So that one zero framework is true from the perspective of multiple lifetimes. So mm. material things, they are temporary ultimately. So from that perspective, they are zero. But within this life, they can make a significant difference. And that is why we see even in our tradition, there is an emphasis on cultivating virtues. On Krishna mm-hmm. in the 12th chapter, he describes what kind of devotee is dear to him. And it's a fascinating discussion. Not once in the 12th chapter, Krishna says, who is the devotee dear to me? Yomad Bhakta Same Priya. He doesn't say a devotee who chants my names. He doesn't say a devotee who hears Bhagavatam. He doesn't say a devotee who worships my deity. He doesn't say mm-hmm. a devotee who goes on Tirtha Yatra. Now, mm-hmm. All these are important. Mm-hmm. But what Krishna says over this? A devotee who is equipoised, a devotee mm. who is kind, who doesn't agitate others, who is friendly mm. towards everyone, mm. who is overall living a sattvic life, a living a virtuous life. Right. So that is also important for Krishna because that is required for maintaining order in this world. So what happens is, why is the, then you somebody, I just live more orderly in this world. Why do I need Krishna at all? That brings us back to the point which we discussed earlier. If we understand that we are eternal beings, if I am an eternal being, then I will long for eternal life, eternal love, eternal joy. And how can I get the eternal if I am not even desiring the eternal? <laughs> if I am living in the mode of goodness, I am not yet still desiring the eternal. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. I want to feed the poor people. That's very good. But, okay, if you feed poor people, in the Vedic tradition you said that, if you food poor people by giving charity in your next life, you will never be short of food. You will never go hungry. That's good. At least it will not suffer from hunger in the next life. But that still means that we are going to take birth in this world. It's still in the mm. domain of temporary world. So why is bhakti required ultimately? Because bhakti means the process for developing our love for the eternal. Right. And love for the eternal is essential for attaining the eternal. That's why without bhakti, just by good deeds, we may help create a better world, relatively speaking. But we won't go to a better world. Mm. We won't go to a better world. We won't go to the eternal world. Because to go to the eternal world, just good deeds in this world are not enough. Mm. Because good deeds don't automatically create love for God. Mm. And for going to the kingdom of God, love for God is needed. For going to the eternal, love for the eternal is needed. So that's why both the ideal situation is bhakti with virtues. If a person mm-hmm. is cultivating sadguna, is having virtues, then they will contribute constructively in this world. And a person who is practicing bhakti, then they will go beyond this world. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> I'm just going to really briefly try to recount that. That um, sometimes we, we may, in bhakti, we may do a zero one analysis of all or nothing analysis. And uh, on the other extreme, it would be just, just be a good person, you know, good Samaritan and God will take us back. So that might be a slightly Abrahamic uh, understanding that if we are a good person, then somehow we'll, uh, the door of heaven will open for us. But, uh, yes. but you're saying that, uh, that both are essential, but if you truly want to get through that door to go back to God and the eternal reality, then we, then we absolutely must have a love for that eternal. It's not enough to just be on a yes. um, <laughs> good Samaritan platform, maybe. Uh, and, and, and obviously Krishna spends a, a great deal of time in explaining 
uh, who was very dear to him with all of these beautiful qualities. So it's not in vain. Uh, sooner or later, yeah, probably rise to that. Thank you so much for that, Prabhu. If maybe uh, you could do your beautiful uh, <laughs> analysis summary. and <laughs> summary, summary, and, and maybe bring it all together. There are so many more questions that I would love to ask you, but obviously it's um, coming to that time. So maybe if we yeah. could just uh, summarize on how we are meant to be freeing ourselves from this karma okay. today. Yeah. So first point broadly we discussed is that I'm here. We can't use karma. Am I audible now? Yes. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So the first point we discussed was that for for working responsibly for acting, karma is not a justification for giving up our dharma. It is not a justification for saying that you are suffering and you keep suffering your own karma. No, we, when we face suffering in anyone's life, anyone's suffering, we have to see what is my dharma. So dharma is my duty, my contribution, the right thing for me to do. So then that what does we discuss that? Then what is the point of understanding karma? It is that when somebody is suffering, there could be multiple causes for it. We look at the immediate cause. We we are not blind to the immediate cause, but we don't. We are not blinded by the immediate cause to everything else. Mm -hmm. So, the bull Dharmaraj, he he did look beyond the immediate cause. I don't know what is the bigger cause, but Parikshit Maharaj, he saw the immediate cause and he said, "Yes, I'm going to deal with this, and I appreciate that you are able to see beyond this also." Mm -hmm. So that's how the compassion can be maintained, and then in that connection, actually, before this session, we started with how the problem of evil, why small children are suffering. Why they will get mm -hmm. with bone cancer or something like that. So there we discussed that. Okay, we have three options. One is everything is arbitrary. It's just by chance. The problem with that is threefold. First is that nobody functions like that. In a day-to-day -day life, nobody trains their children. Mm -hmm. You know, you just study, but ultimately what you're going to do in the life is arbitrary. It's go by chance. Your study is not going to determine your results. No, we don't we don't function like that in life. Even science operates based on cause and effect. Mm -hmm. And this doctrine of everything happening by chance. It doesn't remove our suffering. It only removes the hope that our suffering has for a purpose. Mm. So this chance is not at all a reasonable explanation. Mm -hmm. What ultimately chance does is it leads to the idea of atheism, which is associated with everything happening by chance. Ultimately, the, the kind of sufferings that come in our life come by chance. That leads to us being proud of some islands of emotion of meaninglessness. Mm. On the other hand, the the theistic worldview, if it is only associated with one lifetime, then also it becomes God is arbitrary. And it's very difficult to worship an arbitrary God. So the <laughs> third option is that it's like, why is the scoreboard showing such a different score right in the beginning? Is the, score, is the scoreboard is messed up? It's operating by chance? Is it that the scorekeeper is biased? Is there the second thing is going on? So the principle of karma actually reconciles, karma spread over multiple lifetimes, reconciles a just God with individual accountability. Mm. And purpose of karma is not post-mortem. You're not going to blame people for what they did in the past. It's more for prognosis. How can I act right now? So how can I act in a way that I can create a better future? And karma is not an absolute explanation for every problem. You could say that it is because we don't know the details exactly what karma came when and how it came, what karma came because of what. But it is reasonably empowering. And we humans have to cultivate humility in every area of life that we never get exhaustive knowledge. We, we have to take major decisions based on finite knowledge. Like how much is the exact speed of my car? What is the exact nature of the career that I'm choosing? What is the exact nature of the person I am having a relationship, entering into a relationship? We all start with finite knowledge. But mm. the finite knowledge can also be helpful. So karma is, we discuss that perspective. That Then the, I talk about the frames of reference. Karma is, why did a glass fall from my hand? So mental health means that I should be able to place what is happening to me in the most constructive, most empowering framework. Mm. So karma is just one more framework. So if a child is crying, 
the mother should not think that a child is crying because of the past karma. The con- immediately the mother's mother's framework is, what is my dharma right now? Let me do that. But after taking the child to a doctor, giving treatment, if somehow the child's disease is not going and the child is still crying, then the mother can say, how do I accept this? Okay, maybe there is some karma going on in the past. Mm. So that may be the conservative framework. So that requires intelligence for us to use. So any philosophy can be misused. So yes, karma philosophy has been misused to sometimes perpetuate injustice. But then that way, because the technology has been misused for causing destruction and wars and so much casualty. But do we, we don't blame technology for that. Mm. Similarly, similarly, philosophy is also a resource. So we have to learn to use it properly. Then in that connection, discussed about we came to the moral as a topic of how does how, how do we reduce our karma? Why is God needed? So karma is not as ultimately a retributive justice. It's not for retribution. It is more for reformation. Mm. And that's why if we align with the Lord's will, then there is no need for us to get cosmic suffering, any kind of suffering. And when we are aligning with the Lord's will, then sometimes we may may be exempt from the normal rules of traffic. So that so the way there's a huge misalignment is vikarma. A reasonable level of misalignment, not following the traffic rules is vikarma. Following the traffic rules but going on on one's own one's own self-centered desire. That is karma. Fall, uh, following the traffic rules and then doing the Lord's will. It's like doing working with the government. That is more like a karma. So then mm-hmm. we discussed how does our karma become, how, do, how does bhakti help us? That's five levels. First is knowledge for making the right choices. Then knowledge about what choices are right. Then purity mm-hmm. or willpower or inner strength to make the right choices. Third is tolerance by knowing that the suffering is temporary whereas our destiny is ultimately eternal, like the mm-hmm. leech example. And fourth is that uh, a positive, purposeful, a positive, meaningful vision of the problem. Why is this coming? And the fifth is minimization by the Lord. So in mm-hmm. this way, our karma gets reduced. And then last point which we discussed, I think it came in the most in the question answers, was that when we are functioning in our day-to-day lives, our focus always has to be on how... Uh, I cannot just presume that I am doing God's will. Mm. You say, I have to learn. So that there's a guna framework is there. We need to cultivate virtues. And if we rise from a lower mode to higher mode, from rajas, tamas means complete misalignment, not even pursuing material reality properly. Rajas means only pursuing material reality. Sattva means pursuing mat- perceiving material, material and spiritual reality. So only when a person is living more or less in sattva, can they actually be a recipient and instrument for God's will? Mm. Otherwise, they're just doing their own will. And that's why at one level for all of us, without bhakti, we cannot be delivered. That's why we need to practice bhakti. At another level, if everybody comes to slightly higher level mode, they all can make their life better and their uh, the, the world slightly better. So ideal is we are practicing bhakti and we are cultivating virtue, cultivating sattva. Then we can contribute right. constructively in this world and we can also go beyond this world. Mm. Thank you very wow. much. <laughs> As, for anyone listening, you, you will be able to attest to how, how brilliant that summary was. So thank you. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Uh, we're very, very grateful. Please bless us all so that we can understand this wisdom. We can surrender to this uh, path of bhakti and thereby make our life a little bit more meaningful, purposeful, joyful. And um, we'll see you Thank you for your soon. thoughtful questions and thank you for this opportunity to share this very profound wisdom. Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you everyone for listening. Hare Krishna.